Good day, Jez and Andrea. Uh, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Before we get started talking about your, your tool, which I think is a very cool tool for capturing and reporting out behavior analysis data, um, please introduce yourselves to our audience and establish you know, your, your background in L&D and how this tool may fit. Sure. I'll jump in, Andre, if that's all right. So uh, hello, everybody. I'm Jez Benson, as Guy just mentioned. Uh, I, my current role is CEO of a company called Canvas Leadership. So, you know, predominantly focused on leadership and culture transformation work. My background, I have been doing this work for the best part of 25 years, I would say. Previous to my current role, I was a CEO of a large international um, learning and development organization, again, primarily focused in with leaders and teams um, based in Westport, Connecticut. So although you're not hearing a strong uh, Connecticut accent, uh, I've been living in the States for the best part of 20 years, something like that. Andre. Thank you, Jess. Um, Guy, I want to take a slightly more personal approach to answering the question, and it's wrapped up in why I'm doing what I'm doing. So let me let me start there, even though it might not make uh, complete sense initially. So the accent um, <clears throat> is Cape Town, South Africa. My name, Andre Kortsi. Uh I was born 1968, and that means I grew up in apartheid South Africa. Uh, I received my military draft papers at the age of 16, uh, 1984. Um, I served between the years of 1986 and 1991, which marked the end of apartheid. ANC was unbanned, Nelson Mandela was released, and uh, the rest is, um, is history. Um, I was fortunate enough around that time to receive a study grant, and I could have studied anything uh, that I was qualified for. Um, I chose primary school teaching, and the reason for that is uh, pure idealism. Uh, I had lived through what I thought was one of the most horrible periods in any nation's history, um, and it was caused by a failure to communicate. Um, it was caused by uh, people not understanding each other and telling stories about each other and believing those stories. Um, and I wanted to work with young people before they got caught up in that collective cultural storytelling. And uh, we could learn to tell new stories. Uh, as always, idealism um, does not always uh, meet reality in, a, in an easy manner. And I didn't survive institutional education. Uh, it was too constricting for me. I didn't want to teach that way. I didn't want to learn that way. And I, I left uh, uh, primary school education. And I ended up, uh, of all places, in the oil industry. Um, uh, South Africa, Black like Australia, other parts of the world has a long extractive industries kind of history. And uh, I found a home in L&D uh, working with big oil. And uh, I kind of learned from inside out, from the ground up, making the transition from uh, teaching young people to working with adults and understanding education in, uh, let's say, an organizational setting. Um, so I would say uh, much of the way I've, I have learned has been apprenticed. And that's been my, my journey into uh, learning and development and organization development. There's more to that story, but uh, let me stop there. Well, thank you both for those introductions here. Uh, let's go to the main event. You Tell us about your current work and this tool that you have for counting and reporting out behavior analysis data. You know, tell us a little bit what it is, who it's for, who wants to go first? Yeah, right. Why don't I take that one, Jez, and uh, we do this one in reverse. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Jez and I actually work for two different organizations. We have a friendship that spans uh, a lot longer than our, our current working relationship. But uh, we are two different organizations. Jez is with uh, Canvas, um, and uh, I run an organization called Airtime BA. Um, <clears throat> on my journey of apprenticeship, uh, which is you know 30 plus years now, uh, I encountered um, a couple folk doing 
an offshoot of Neil Rackham's work uh, inside of an organization in Europe. And I basically uh, latched onto them and they either had the choice of being rude to me or teaching me. And uh, they ended up uh, very generously teaching me. But um, the way BA data was collected back in those days and still just, you know, a short three, three years ago, it was with a clipboard and a table. You'd basically write the names of the people you're observing across the top and you'd have a list of the behaviors you're observing and then you sit in a corner and you just count. And obviously it's more than that, um, but uh, at its heart, that's the nature of the work. Um, come COVID and uh, we go, well, we've got time on our hands, uh, what now? Um, so myself and a small group of uh, collaborators, uh, we essentially digitized that process. So um, we have a digital way of collecting data. We still need the manual observation, but you are now working on an iPad or on a computer. So we're going straight from observation into a behavioral database. And um, uh, we can produce reports in a matter of seconds after the period of observation is complete. Not only that, the task of um, uh, doing comparative studies between periods of observation or e even between individuals that we're observing across different periods all becomes available to us. We're now living in the world of big data and uh, we've got all kinds of tools that allow us to mine databases. So Airtime is essentially a graphic user interface that sits on top of a database that stores the data we collect and then allows us to access that data to create meaningful insights uh, for the clients that we work with. So that's it, uh, as simply as I can say it, Jez. Yeah, and I'll come at it from a little bit of a different angle, which is, um, and maybe we'll we'll get a chance to share a little bit on the screens, is so some of the problems that we try to solve or some of the frustrations that I have had over the years um, with clients around trying to develop particular capabilities and competencies and how we apply this framework to that in a very objective way. So, Guy, you know this work inside and out. It, it's, it's in its objectivity where it, it finds its power um, for, for participants because most feedback is subjective or intersubjective at, at best. Um, so I'm going to give you a real live client uh, body of work, basically, um, which demonstrates um, the challenge that we have. So and this is quite this is a simplified version, just to, just so the audience can kind of start to think about this. But a client comes to you, particularly in the leadership development space, and says something like, uh, "We have a new." set of leadership competencies or capabilities um and we need all of our leaders to be and i'll pick a hot topic of the moment we need them all to be uh inclusive okay and we all know the reasons why and it, it gets explained and da, da, da. and you sit there at the end of all of that and go okay that makes sense it's a very nicely written capability competency um about how you want that person to be as a, as a leader but what the hell do they do right so you know <laughs> i want you to be inclusive right now guy be inclusive like well, <laughs> what, do you, what do you do like what do you say how, how does how does that actually work and so the reason why uh the framework of behavioral analysis is is really powerful is because you can quite quickly look at that and say we know exactly the things that inclusive leaders need to do not be but do mm -hmm. so in a group situation like this if i wanted to be perceived as inclusive and at the moment i'm not because i am in behavioral analysis terms giving information but if i wanted to be perceived as being inclusive or not even perceived but wanted to be inclusive i would say hey guy tell us what you're thinking about what andre and i have just said and you come and would respond to that if I gave you the opportunity to do that. And you would fill that space with your thoughts and reflections and, and reactions. That's me being inclusive. Because at the moment, in this conversation between the three of us, you have not been included. 
not much. A little bit at the start to get things going. But contextually, it's probably correct because it's an interview and you've asked us questions and we're now answering them. But if you change that context to a leader in an organization with a team solving complex problems, trying to innovate, trying to do this, that, and the other, and you want them to be inclusive, you need to be showing them what they need to do as leaders. One of those things is a behavior of bringing in. Now, there are many others, and that's a very simplified version of it. But the reason we really like this is is because you can help leaders change their behavior by being very clear about what they need to do. And of course, we don't do this nicely uh, within the design of our programs. And we can we can talk about this. We want to throw participants into situations and see if they do. Right. See if they are inclusive or not, or whatever the the competency is that we're trying to uh, see in action. And then we can hold the mirror up, which is the results. Right. So as Andre said, you get them instantly. You can hold the mirror up and say, okay, in the last hour and a half during this work, how inclusive were you? And you can see that very objectively. And then you can have a very easy conversation off the back of it, which is, okay, you were because you did all of these things or you weren't because you didn't do all of these things. And then from a behavior change standpoint, it gives people the opportunity to say, all right, if I want to be more inclusive, I, next time out, I need to do these. Okay, well, let's go on the next time out and see what that looks like. So that that that's my passion behind this is, is, is it's application to hold the mirror up to leaders and really show them um, what their behaviors really are um, and, and how that comes across. Yes, thank you. I So my background is that I observed Neil Rackham delivering spin sales training and, and his one of his business partners back then in 1981, John Carlisle, was delivering a win-win negotiations program. And I saw how they used simulation exercises, role plays, and people were communicating with each other, trying to make a decision or create a plan or whatever. Um, and so I was trained in doing behavior analysis uh, by Neil Rackham. And so I borrowed those ideas in my own consulting practice, designing simulation exercises for various jobs. And it, it, I always had one of the learners, one of the students, uh, act the role as an observer and counting the behaviors of a key person and not everybody at the table because that got to be too complex and you couldn't rely on somebody doing that. And so, but we used the paper and pencil and ticked off each time we heard a giving information or a seeking information or a testing understanding or summarizing. And those were the four that I simplified my list to because I was trying to reduce the complexity because it's hard to administrate this in the course of a learning and development experience. And what I really liked about your tool is that, yeah, you can use a tablet, you can observe these things and you can very easily uh, tick them. And then what we talked about uh, in a previous conversation was that not only can you give me that data instantaneously, but you can give me other information bes besides just the pure count in the duration of the meeting or whatever that it was that it was being observed. Yeah. What I really liked about this was the convenience to giving feedback to people. And if you're trying to get people to, generally this is true, I think, give less information and seek more information or elicit more information from others. And people usually start off giving way too much information. And this is a way to begin to show them if they are making progress and reducing that and increasing some of the other behaviors. Yeah. Um, and I know the behavior model, uh, there's there's many of them. There's a, a bunch of different uh, behaviors that you could identify and count. Um, but talk to me a little bit more about how you have used this or your clients have used this in an instructional uh, endeavor in a learning experience and the kind of feedback that was you were able to give to, you know, who, whoever the the training or learning was aimed at yeah i actually and and uh, andre I'll, I'll hand over to you in a second i i, I can do a screen share as well because I've, I've just come off of a project with an executive team um, okay. and, and there's some super interesting data in there but but i want to go back to one of the things that you said that, that it's no um uh mistake that andre's organization is called airtime ba um obviously the ba center for behavioral analysis you mentioned about what's the other data that technology allows us to capture and one is pure airtime. 
right? So, you know, if you're checking the boxes, if somebody has a lot of boxes, they've typically been talking more because they have more checks, right? Within this system, we can actually time how much airtime people have taken. So actually the first piece of data that um, that folks get is, uh, isn't, you know, which behaviors. It's actually a pie graph of percentages of airtime with no names against it that says, okay, who was who? You know, who who did all the talking, who didn't, so on and so forth. So even before you get into the behaviors, you can start to look at things like airtime. Um, anyway, Andre, over o- over to you um, for this, and I'll maybe do a screen share of a recent piece of work. Sure. I think um, <clears throat> the piece I'd, I'd like to build on is uh, Jeremy's comment. Um, I want to be uh, I want to be more inclusive. And uh, if I reflect on my journey from uh, childhood learning to adult learning as an educator, when we're in a childhood learning space, we kind of tell kids uh, what they need to learn. Uh, we have highly curated curriculums, uh, all kinds of thoughts around how those curriculums fit together uh, to uh, engage uh, people to learn and grow. But we are defining as an institution, the content. And uh, one of the big differences uh, between childhood learning and adult learning is uh, uh, that adults don't really care about what you want to teach them. They care about what they want to learn. And the key here is to get them to a place where they say, I want to learn that. And um, uh, so in, in the way that we, we use data and work with data with a client, um, it's seldom that we're being prescriptive. And it's more that we are uh, presenting them with information and asking them to make meaning out of it. And that mirror that Jeremy was talking about, um, uh, uh, you know, what is it reflecting back? Is it reflecting back someone that they know or is it for reflecting back a stranger? Well, uh, I don't do that. You know, the only reason I did it on this occasion is because they were all sitting there quiet. So I had to do that. Um, so you can begin to now work into that um, uh, view that they have of themselves as a coach. And uh, the key here is that we are not telling people do more of this or do less of that in the way that airtime works. Uh, we presenting them with uh, compelling data and a process that basically takes them from uh, a qualitative review of conversations that they've had deeper and deeper into a quantitative understanding of what they did. Um, and what we're very clear about is, yes, I agree with you. This is not you. Um, we are not assessing your personality. That we, we, We're not doing anything that is talking about uh, you know, what your preferences and likes and dislikes are, all we're doing is reflecting what you did in the last 120 minutes that we observed you. Now, you can tell us you're not that person, but you can't say that that's not what you did because we can capture that data to a very high degree of accuracy. So uh, we, we use the data to move our clients into, and I'm just talking generally, Jez gave you a specific example, to move our clients generally into transformative learning processes, where each of them individually are making choices about how they show up. And if they want to be more inclusive, uh, to Jez's point, that really starts their journey. Well, on the, beha- on the basis of this behavior, I, it didn't appear that I was that inclusive, but my image of myself, the story I tell myself about myself is of an inclusive individual. So how do I get closer to who I want to be? Um, and that's really uh, uh, one of the, the great prizes that we pursue in our work. Um, uh, yeah, I think there are probably some more specific things that you, you, you're you looking for, Guy, but uh, let me take a pause there. Uh, between Jez and I, how, how are we inching up to answering your question? Well, I, I, I think you are. It's, 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 a, it's a model, it's a tool to help cap, capture and reflect back to people what they did. 
And I think that that's, you know, used in learning to help reshape people's behavioral profiles or communications profiles or whatever language you want to use. I think that that I think that's very, very exciting that that this is available. And I can see, you know, to me, communications behaviors, which is what I've renamed uh, the behavior analysis because there's other nonverbal behaviors and it's sometimes confusing to people. But so we're talking about communications and various types of communications, this behavior an analysis model and the distinct um, uh, communications that you can do. We can shape people, and I've used this in product team meet, uh, manager tr uh, training so that they would learn how to facilitate a team meeting where there's different opinions and different needs and wants and different constraints of organizations trying to come up with a, a, a product plan and a set of financials to go along with that. I've also used this in labor relations training where uh, a a supervisor is meeting with a union steward and a union employee and going over some issue. And, but the sense that I've always had in working with Neil Rackham and that is that because they had such tremendous amount of data behind their spin selling model and their win-win negotiations model. And I never had that. All I could say is that you need to change your profile. Not that, you know, at the first, 10 minutes of a meeting or something that 50% should be this kind of behavior and then the rest spread uh, equally around in a certain pattern, which is, I think, one of the things that Neil was doing with all of his research going back into the 70s, et cetera. It seems to me that your tool can be used to build a profile for a master in a particular job where there's a lot of communications uh, going on that that you could use this to build up. Here's our best 10% of our salespeople. Here's what they do at the beginning and the middle and the end of a sales call, much like spin selling investigated. But you could look at, at all of your top negotiators, uh, your top purchasing agents or whatever, and you can begin to build a profile, a model, a valid success model, as Neil would call it, uh, for a particular job. And I thought that's what's exciting too, because I can use your tool in the analysis of uh, for instructional purposes. And then when I'm delivering and deploying the instruction, I can use it then to see am, what's the baseline for somebody and have we shifted their behavioral profile in the second time they did it and the third time they did it and the fourth time they did, they did it. And I think that that's what's really powerful. I've always believed that these simulation exercises can't be one and done. You got to let somebody practice something, give them some feedback, and then have them do it again to see if you can get that change of their profile in this particular example. Andre and I were on a call, I don't know, what was it, nine o'clock this morning, Andre, something like that, a couple of hours ago. Um, you use the word baseline. We, we, we have exactly that with a particular client right now where we're working with all of their leaders at all levels in the organization um, to get that baseline. And then, you know, some development work and then rerun again. And then we can see the 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 shifts that we want to see from a behavior standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, let me just share this one with you. You'll like this. Um, I'm going to ask the, I'm going to talk to the audience as if they were actually here live. Um, <laughs> I'm going to share this screen. Are you seeing that? Yes. It says airtime by percentage. This is the only one I'm going to show you on this because the rest of this document has the participants' names on it. And I get yeah. shot by them if I went any further, but I do have a separate one, which is uh, which is a sample, but I wanted to use this one because it's, it's a real example. Um, so this is a senior leadership team because um, the other thing we're starting to see is obviously not baseline, not just baseline and shifting in behavior, but we're also starting to see themes across different teams, right? So uh, we've now run this, I don't know, in the last year with dozens of senior teams and we're starting to see themes across those teams with some of the early data. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. This organization has a new set of values that they created, um, had nothing to do with us in the creation, but, but they shared them with us. And one of those values was to be inviting, right? be inviting. So as part of the work with the senior leadership team, I was like, well, if you're wanting to drive these values throughout the organization, you need to be living them. So I want to see whether you live these behaviors. So of course we set up a uh, a task. It wasn't um, wasn't a simulation. It was actually a real 
current business issue mm-hmm. uh, that, that the group was uh, having to start to consider. Um, we wrote it as a as a challenge, as an issue that we wanted to know their 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 thoughts and direction moving forward and put that in front of them. And I think the observation was about 90 minutes, something like that. So here's the first report slide, right, which is the airtime of the six members of that team. And of course, something stark jumps off the page. And that is one of the people spoke for 52 percent of the time. Uh, more than the other five people put together. So when you put this up in front of the group of six and you say who's who, it's very obvious who fifty who fifty two percent is. That person points at themselves immediately. Um, uh, they are shocked that the time is actually more than the other five put together. They know they talk a lot. They know they talk more than others, um, but they don't know that they talk for fifty two percent of the time. And then you have your nineteen percent. They know who they are. The other four had no clue, right? Who's the six, the seven, or the nine? I have no idea. It would be one of the four of us, you know, whoever that might be. But then when you drill down into this and say, this this could be great, right? If some of the behaviors in here were about being inviting, okay? So if we drill down into Mr. 52, uh, I can tell you that that 52% is made up of 175 separate behaviors. Okay, they they spoke 175 times, counted. Of that, if you think about giving information versus seeking information, right, mm-hmm. which is one thing that could be about inviting. I'm seeking information from people. They had 80, or they had 94 of those 175 behaviors in the giving and seeking. 87 were giving, and seven were seeking. So not particularly inviting, but maybe maybe those seven of seeking information were really powerful and really big and allowed 19% to talk a lot more. Who knows? Okay. We were there. We can talk about it. Then we go, okay, let's drill down a little bit deeper and look at how much, how many times of the remaining, you know, 75 behaviors, did they use the behavior of bringing in, which would be another one around a value of inviting. And it was zero. Okay. So I can tell you right now that that person, person number 52 knows exactly what they need to be doing if they want to be more inviting and has immediately started to change their behavior back in the back in the workplace. And not only that, but 9%, 6%, 7%, and 7% now have a right to go after Mr. 52% and say, hey, you're doing it again. And provide that feedback in a really open and honest way. And it's really started to develop this team where next time we run this, we'll be looking at a very different set of data, which will be reducing that and bringing in different behaviors if they truly want to be a more inviting uh, culture. So again, a a live example, a recent client, um, super interesting work. Guy, it might be helpful, um, and uh, tell me if this is gonna take us sideways, but just to explore a little bit the nature of the relationship between airtime and Canvas because it um, explains our business model a bit, Airtime, BA's business model. Please, go ahead. Um, All Airtime is, at this point, is a capability. Now, um, I was interested in um, uh, what you were saying about Neil. So my two teachers also studied under Neil. Uh, You might know them, um, uh, uh, Tony Hipgrave and uh, Pete Francis. I'm not familiar with them, no, but okay. they are based in the UK. And um, uh, airtime, our first goal is to build the capability. Capability has now been built. Our second goal is to build our database. So um, what's the fastest way to build a behavioral a behavior database. Um, uh, I can tell you uh, at least the way that we're doing it is to crowdsource it. We don't try and do that job ourselves. So um, Airtime BA owns the capability. We own this product called Airtime. Uh, uh, Canvas owns the relationship with the client. So 
as, as Canvas builds solutions for its clients, it goes, hey, you know what? We need this capability in there. And they contract with Airtime just to provide them with the capability. Um, uh, the other thing that we have figured out in addition to that business model, um, which allows Jeremy and I uh, to perform very comfortably next to each other. We never in competition with each other. Um, uh, the other thing uh, that we have done, um, and just listening to your story, I know it's a, it's a struggle that you walked into. Uh, how do you teach other people to do this? Uh, it took me, uh, and I, I'm not the you know sharpest tack in the in 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 the draw. It it took me seven years, and uh, you know, granted, I didn't have continuous opportunity. I had to hop on a plane, fly to the UK, sit with those guys for two weeks, you know, get get beaten up by them, tell them all the ways I got it wrong. Then I'd come back, and three months later, I'd try and do it again. Um, it wasn't really a conducive learning environment. Um, so what we've been able to do is um, with a very uh, high degree of uh, repeatability, we have now trained 40. Um, we call them coders. Again, trying to get away from this notion of behavior analysts because the field is so much bigger. Um, uh, people who can observe a group of eight people in real time and attribute one of 18 behaviors to them as the conversation uh, progresses. Um, that training period takes about two months. So we can go from, hey, I'm a librarian, uh, but I'd like to learn how to code. Or, hey, uh, I'm in L&D. Um, uh, what I'm seeing is extremely effective. I want some of that. Uh, how do I learn? Um, I can take such a person who has no history uh, with behavior analysis and train them up in two months uh, to around 90% accuracy. Some people uh, get much higher, uh, uh, some people uh, around um, you know, 80% plus. But for the most part, we can get people to 90% accuracy. So our goal at Airtime is essentially to uh, democratize this work. Um, at, its, at its simplest, I was so excited to hear those four behaviors you observe. At its simplest, um, it's giving someone a napkin and a pen and say, hey, watch that person. Tell me at the end of the meeting exactly how many questions they ask. Just count it. Um, that's the simplest version of the work. And, and uh, that's where my love for the work started. Um, but our task here is essentially to build that database. And um, uh, I'm not doing it. Jeremy's not doing it. We're doing it together. And we've got other clients like Jeremy, like Canvas, that we are working with in a similar manner. So we take a real small piece of the pie. Um, you know, the cost of a report is not different than a Hogan. Um, uh, we're not trying to um, uh, uh, make a lot but we're trying to do a lot and we're trying to build this behavior, uh, behavior database so that there is added value down the line where we can say, well, if you look at this level in organizations and you running a development center, this is kind of what you should be expecting from your executives. Or if you're looking to hire people um, to work in a, a, a sales uh, capacity or business development capacity. This is the profile of the person that you that you want. But what we need is a massive database, and our database probably already rivals Rackham's. Uh, we have, I'm guessing, over 150,000 discrete records, um, and that is growing exponentially. Yeah. Um, let me uh, let me interrupt you here and uh, ask this question. Well, here we are back after two days. We had a bit of a technical difficulty. So in trying to uh, begin to wrap up our interview here, uh, can you both describe the typical workflow steps that you go through with your clients and when and how do you work with them? Can you paint us a big picture here of what it's like to uh, use your services and, and to create one of these simulations? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I'll take this one first, then hand over to Andre. Uh, the a typical ask comes into Canvas leadership, and it's uh, usually about a holistic piece of leadership development work. So, probably easy just to describe a few that I'm working on right now. I'm w- working with a large biotech organization out of California, top 500 um, leaders within the business, new vision and strategy for the organization that needs to be met with a new way of leading the organization as well. So the organization is transforming. Those leaders are going to need to transform as well. So we're sat down with the client looking at that strategy, looking at that vision, and then saying, right, what do we need to do from a leadership standpoint? Now, it's probably going to end up being a six to nine month journey um, that will be a blended uh, program, you know, live, virtual, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And behavior analysis will be a piece of that because as we look at what their needs are around leaders and behavior change, uh, they're looking at one of the things about having much more of an inquiring mind. So I instantly go, oh, okay. Then I know that a piece of that program, this is going to fit. Um, and so then I would be working with Andre to say, right, here's the client, here's the program, let's partner together on developing this um, and design it. So we'll spend between now and October designing the program. We'll probably do a pilot with a group of 40 or so, and then next year it will roll out to the top 500. So that's a typical one um, for a senior leadership program. Other ones would be hypo uh, programs at, at any particular level within an organization. So that's how, again, it gets used. All real teams, particularly senior leadership teams, executive teams who really want to focus on how are we behaving as a group of people and what is the reality. Um, so, again, we would build whatever that holistic solution looks like and behavioral analysis would be a would be a piece of that. Andre, over to you. Uh, uh, I think, uh, well, that's well described, Jeremy. Um, <clears throat> the the work that we do at Airtime um, it, it, it is enabling work um, and uh, it can stand alone, but it operates best inside of a container. Um, uh, we have a group of people that are, are skilled at observing de- uh, behavior, capturing that data, reporting it and using it to coach for development. Um, and uh, uh, on its own, that's valuable. Inside of something bigger um, that is, uh, let's say, more contextually grounded in what the organize- organization needs to accomplish, it can be more powerful. Um, <clears throat> so uh, from the airtime side, we would simply get a request from uh, from Jeremy, hey, uh, we've got this client. Um, we find out if it's face to face or in person um, uh, with the magic of Zoom. We've actually been doing this work a lot virtually and very successfully so. Uh, so we can uh, we would just find out, do we need to be uh, on site or can we be remote? Uh, we would staff it. Our staff would arrive at the allotted time and uh, we would get a, a list of names uh, from Jeremy that we would pull into the tool and we'd know what groups of people are together. We'd partner our staff up with them and uh, essentially set the conversation in motion or whatever the business simulation is that we are observing. Um, And we kind of disappear into the background. That part of the work hasn't changed, uh, Guy. Um, uh, We the quiet people uh, sitting in the corner. And it's interesting (laughs) you used the word simulation there, Andre. You know, as I was thinking about it, uh where what do you do we design to observe participants going through this so that could be anything from a 90 minute to two hour conversation that could be something very business relevant very strategic um challenging difficult multiple opinions you know something that they need to wrestle with all the way through to a day day and a half long um custom designed real world immersive leadership challenge so you know so it could be very sophisticated um place to observe or it could be much more simple 
place to observe. Um, and of course, we do multiple observations as well. So you can do one offs in that hour and a half and they get the data or you could do observation on one day and then the next day you do something else you do another observation and they get that's where they start to get two sets of feedback so you can see the behavior change in real time mm -hmm. i was thinking that uh, you, you can observe you know people do it going about their normal business day and meeting or whatever and yeah. get feedback in that so but i was kind of interested in in how you might set up uh, a scenario a role play simulation or something like that uh, to get people engaged in something and you know give them feedback based on their behavior profile from from that yeah i mean if you think about you know observing a, a real team in action uh sometimes you know if that's like a team meeting if their team meeting is structured as of just doing a bunch of updates then all you get is giving information giving information giving information giving it, right. it's not it's not substantial enough. So what you really want is a group, and Andre will talk to this a little bit more. You really want a group in a dynamic situation, typically looking at a problem or a challenge or an opportunity mm -hmm. where there's differing opinions. Uh, maybe it's something a little contentious, you know, because we want to see that group, you know, really wrestle with something. So the design of what you get the group to do is actually really important. And, and we're, big fans of not having that being too abstract um mm -hmm. so we work with the client organization to to extract that that exact thing so you know we work with one client around you know digital transformation within their organization and their struggles with digital transformation let's get them into that conversation because oh boy there's a lot to be talked about there within the business so that 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 does a, a it does a really nice job um and then these bigger simulations where we we take a real issue or opportunity that the organization's facing and bring it to life in a simulated way in a program and have that observed so people don't feel like again it's a metaphorical activity that doesn't have anything to do with work um it feels like and is actual real work but we're 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 simulating it because it's a group of participants that's come into a program yeah yeah given we've double clicked on on that piece of the work it's it's probably one of the most important things for us to do. And um, I would just say in, in my experience, there have been topics that uh, the businesses that are, are hiring us want to talk about, uh, but the people in the meeting are not interested in that conversation. So there's a bit of a journey um, in, on, on the consulting side when you're pulling these together to make sure that the topic you have means something to the people in the topic, uh, in, in, in the meeting, because then it pulls them into the conversation and uh, you get a, a lot more authentic behavior out of it. Uh, so that's, that's a real key part. Um, I was actually interviewing a, a client this morning, a organization I was working with uh, last year, an executive team and uh, they had a hard time through COVID um, big enough to have lost uh, 1.5 billion dollars um, in one year big organization and uh, they've recovered they've recovered fabulously um, and we're working together again um, uh, in a, a month or so's time and I just asked them hey how how, how has it been going and uh, the one individual said, Andre, uh, I've attended many trainings uh, in my life. And we didn't do training with them. We were there for three days. We did strategic planning. BA was just one element of that. And um, they said, uh, when we're in a meeting now, we all know what the right kind of behavior that we're looking for uh, in that meeting looks like. And we know when we are not demonstrating it. And the other thing that happens is everyone else in that meeting knows we're not demonstrating it too. Um, so it's uh, that really uh, sums up the impact of our work um, because where we go from observing is into that coaching space. And as I was describing uh, earlier in our conversation, um, the work when we uh, when we coaching. Um, it's not to hit them over the head with, um, uh, you know, reams of data. It's to get them to a place where they're looking at themselves and saying, how do I want to be? 
uh, where they internalize the role of the coach. And when they leave the meeting, they're actually bringing the voice of the coach with them. They, they can begin to, to edit themselves um, while, they are, uh, while they are behaving. So um, uh, once we finished observation, we enter coaching um, and typically we work with a group first. Um, and then depending on the kind of work we do, uh, we will have follow up one on one uh, which, with each of the people. The reports we produce are fairly substantive. They're about 28 pages long, um, uh, giving uh, people a good sense of uh, how they're deploying each of those 18 behaviors. Um, and often in combination with each other, ratios of behavior, um, you know, how, whether you're bringing people in or shutting people out, how much of what do you do? Um, so, uh, yeah, typically we would end uh, uh, with one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching between the BA coach and the, and the learner. And then there's a handoff from uh, uh, the team at Airtime to the team at Canvas or whoever we might be partnering with. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. So let me switch gears here just a little bit here. I would like to give you each a chance as you represent uh, separate companies that collaborate a lot, but uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your company and the products and services that you, you run into the marketplace. Andre, would you go first? Sure. So as I said, we have, a, we have this core capability, which is airtime, uh, the ability to uh, uh, capture and report behavior data. And um, <clears throat> around it, we have uh, essentially a, a group of partners, people that we work with to get to the market. Uh, so we would work with Jeremy. Jeremy would own the relationship with the client, um, and we would simply bring our capability to Jeremy. Uh, so that's the one form of business-to-business -business relationship uh, that uh, uh, that we look for, and it's probably the most important to us. Um, the reports are not expensive, uh, like I said, and um, so we have to have other ways of making money as well, certainly while that business model begins to grow. Over time, we think our data is going to be our most valuable asset, uh, but until then, uh, we also need this ability to um, uh, uh, provide product as well as service. So if uh, a company does reach out to Airtime directly, we will do a certain amount of you know, strategic planning. All of the stuff that Jeremy was talking about, we would take that on. Um, but our goal is to do less and less of that and to do more of uh, training behavior analysts and then servicing the market with this capability. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, how you would get hold of us, um, I would suggest two ways. Uh, one is LinkedIn. So just find uh, Andre Kortsi on LinkedIn and I'll provide you with that profile guy. And uh, the other is um, you can come to our website, uh, uh, which is airtimeba.com, www.airtimeba.com. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so for Canvas, uh, in in a nutshell, and it's hard to do a nutshell because we do a lot of work. Um, we're, we would we describe ourselves as a global leadership and culture transformation company. So our work is definitely rooted in those two two things, and often those two things are combined. Um, uh, we are global, so we work with clients all over the world, um, and we have staff all over the world to be able to execute on those projects. They tend to be large scale um, projects with with clients. Um, the types of audience is everything from an executive team all the way down to a project team. We don't do any L and D work with ind individual contributors around particular skills it's all leadership development so new managers yes managers of managers you can go up through the through the leadership pipeline we cover all of that plus the hypo slice um, of that kind of pyramid as well um, a couple of keywords for us is custom um, so a lot of our work is uh, is customized for the client because we're working in context all the time um, and very experiential behavioral mindset shifting based as opposed to just knowledge and skill set based work. 
Uh, easiest way to get hold of us is um, the website, uh, which is canvasleadership.com, um, or email me directly, jez, J-E-Z, dot Benton, B-E-N-T-O-N, at canvasleadership.com. And during this interview, I've been, Andre and yourself and myself, have been using my two names. So I go by Jeremy and I go by Jez. Um, my preferred name is Jez, and that's why it's my email address. Well, thank you for that here. So uh, let me bring this to a close, but I want to offer you any final words of wisdom about what we've been talking about. Any any summations that you would like to do, Andrea? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> when when we started out, uh, you you asked us to credentialize ourselves, and I ended up telling a fairly personal story. Um, uh, and it's I, th I think it's why I do what I do. Um, uh, if Airtime has a tagline right now, it's to make every conversation 100% better. We're, we're interested in leadership, but we're also interested in diplomacy. Uh, we also are uh, uh, interested in um, uh, the classroom. You know, how, how, how are we preparing kids uh, for the future? Are, are we teaching them subject matter or are we teaching them to interact? And um, we're actually interested in the future as well. Uh, I don't know where artificial intelligence is going, but uh, do machines know how to behave? And by the way, what would happen if they did? Um, so there are, there are a number of things that we're interested in. Uh, what, uh, what I would perhaps draw our attention to is the amount of suffering there is in the world that is caused by people who do not know how to talk to each other. And uh, at its heart, that's my story. And um, it's why I got into education. It's why I'm still in education, to reduce the amount of unnecessary suffering in the world. I remain an idealist. And I think uh, a, a behavior analysis offers a key. It is not the solution. But I promise you, it can make every conversation we are in, regardless of the purpose of that conversation, 100% better. Um, and I'm interested in democratizing uh, what has previously been something that very few people who have trained very hard to do it accurately uh, uh, have, been, have been doing in pockets. We want to do it in scale. Uh, we want to open the doors, train as many people as we can, uh, turn people onto the effectiveness, the power of the work, and then turn them loose to the, to the challenges, opportunities, problems that they face. And uh, 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 use the work almost as a, as a, as a fulcrum uh, to, to multiply our impact uh, out in the market. And that's also why we uh, have adopted the business model that we have. We're not trying to have a relationship with every client. We don't want that. That's, it's gonna to be too small. Uh, we want relationships with Canvas. We want relationships with other organizations at scale um, that can uh, take the work out into the market. So we have a very expansive vision and we're looking for people who who want to make a difference to partner with us and it's very easy to partner us uh, partner with us and and we we welcoming of of everybody Thanks. yeah my, my final words were first one is a, a thanks to you guy for uh taking the time to to meet with us and and talk about this work and and doing what you do publicizing this this work on on our behalf we greatly appreciate it um i think my biggest thing is is seeing this work in action with participants and seeing the the change so everything that andre's just talked about about democratizing again to many people and 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 seeing the behavior change when i first saw this i was like I, you know, I, I can't create things. I'm not the creative person. Andre is more a creative person than I am. But when I see something that works in the L&D realm, I will 
jump on it and invest in it and drive it forward and sell it and do all of those things. And I also know when I see garbage in the L and D environment and, you know, it not working and also, so my passion has, has been uh, particularly seeing how participants on leadership development programs have a big awakening when they see this data, because it's very objective. And going back to my opening where I talked about, um, client organizations that are saying we want you to be x type of leader and all of those leaders are scratching their head saying well i don't know how to do that this work does that so you want to be an inclusive if the organization wants you to be an inclusive leader we can help teach you how to do that and that feedback and the objectivity in that feedback and the obviousness in how people showed up and how they need to behave differently move on it's so clear for people that that it, you just see them change their behavior and mindset in the moment. And our business, um, we talk a lot about transformative learning. This as a methodology is truly transformative. Um, so that's why I'm passionate about it. And of course, I get to try and sell it into lots of different clients in lots of different sectors to enable, you know, Andre's vision um, around the work to come to life. Well, thank you for that. And uh, I was uh, happy to host you to discuss this because this behavior analysis work has been uh, uh, very important to me and what it taught me way back in 1981. And uh, I am excited about this tool uh, that you have to help uh, document the process and provide more uh, the accuracy and speed of the feedback to the participants to really help shape their behavior. I, I wish you both well in this. I look forward to hearing more about this as we go on into the future. But uh, gentlemen, thank you and have a great day. Cheers. Thank you so much, Guy. Bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.